So our next speaker is David Jekyll, who will speak on free probability and model theory of tracial Neumann algebras. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, Sri told me to change my title to two one factor so that all the talks in the, today would be two one factor. But uh, whether something is a factor is not that relevant to this talk, unfortunately. Okay, so I guess you guys have all seen the von Neumann algebras before in several talks. Um, what I want to emphasize here as I recap the definition is that we view we can view these as a non commutative analog of probability space. Right, so um, we have a trace of a Neumann algebra. We have a you know a trace. It's it's unital. It's tracial. It's positive. It's faithful. It's normal. Um, and when you have a probability space and you have the L infinity of this probability space, gives you a, a motivating example for this. Right, so commutative tracial von Neumann algebras, um, if they're separable, will all have this form. Um, and uh, so you can view the the expectation in that case as an example of a trace and so in the general setting we consider the trace on the von neumann algebra as an analog of the expectation right and the elements of the von neumann algebra are analogs of l infinity and l infinity of the probability space represents random variables right so the elements of your m are random variables in a non-commutative sense and the trace is the expectation uh, and so Free probability theory um, that came uh, a lot from the work of Voigt-Lescu, but I mean, there's many ideas about non-commutative probability that have been around in, in the physics literature for a while, like studying bosonic and fermionic analogs of things. Uh, and so you really want to just use our knowledge of classical probability theory in order to motivate uh, new results and see what happens in the non-commutative case and how things might be the same or different. So uh, here's uh, one problem uh, that we want to consider. So as in, in, ben, in Ben's talk earlier, you could think about isomorphisms between your operator algebras that map specified uh, tuples to another specified tuple. Right? So we're basically looking at uh, you know, certain generators like that. Um, and our, our goal right now is to figure out how, how could you know uh, what's the right notion of two tuples from your operator algebra behaving the same? Now, the first uh, attempt you could try, well, you could look at what happens in classical probability, and you could say, well, okay, there's, you could look at uh, whether they have the same probability distribution in, in the classical case. And since your random variables are bounded, they're in L infinity, uh, okay, the probability distribution requires you to test against all uh, C0 functions, but if your if your measure is compactly supported, it suffices to check on it on polynomials because those are dense by the uh, stone weierstrass theorem. Right? And so having the same probability distribution could just uh, be reduced to saying that the expectation of any polynomials in X and Y are the same. Um, but then it's also equivalent in classical probability to say that they're approximately conjugate by automorphisms. Right? So if you have a probability space, you have two tuples of random variables with the same distribution, you can find uh, sequences of, of automorphisms which will approximately move the x to the y. Um, and the reason for this is basically you consider a, a, you know, the, the range of possible values of x and y, and you, you partition the range in some nice way, and then uh, the corresponding subsets of the probability space where the values of x land in a, spe in a specific set where the, the values of y land in the specific set, these will, these will have the same measure. And so then you just find some transformation moving these sets to uh, each other. And if you choose the partition fine enough, then this allows you to build an automorphism so that x uh, compose with alpha and y are within epsilon. Right, so in this case, uh, you know, this kind of approximate automorphic equivalence in classical probability is just detected by the probability distribution. So in the non-commutative setting, there has been a lot of work which uses the non-commutative moments, right? Replacing this uh, expectation of P of X equals expectation of P of Y, where now you use non-commutative polynomials, um, in, or in fact, star polynomials um, in, in these uh, tuples X and Y. Um, and so we often use this as a definition of agreeing in non-commutative law or non-commutative distribution. But in a non-commutative setting, it's uh, the equivalence between two and three here fails quite drastically. 
you can have two things which have the same non-commutative moments, but don't behave the same, right? And this is kind of, uh, so if you forgot about the particular generators and you looked at the algebras, then what this would be saying is that you can find two uh, embeddings, two trace preserving embeddings of some algebra into, uh, into M, which are not approximately conjugate by automorphism. Right? And so there's many uh, examples or ways to construct uh, such uh, embeddings that are not conjugate by automorphism. So here I'll uh, consider uh, like in Sri's talk, the property gamma, right? And okay, we could consider, uh, we're, we're gonna consider uh, X and Y to generate copies of a free group von Neumann algebra. So you could take X to be the tuple of unitaries for the generators of the free group. Um, and so if you embedded L of Fn into its ultra product by the diagonal embedding, and I realize I may, I, my fonts don't match here, but these Fn's are supposed to all be the same font. Um, yeah, so, so there's an embedding, the diagonal embedding of L of Fn into L of Fn ultra power. This is not gonna have anything that commutes with it because of the lack of property gamma that L of Fn has. Uh, but I can find another embedding of it that does have a bunch of stuff that commutes with it. And the reason for that is, well, I could just take L of Fn tensor L infinity, and this will be con embeddable. Uh, and if it's con embeddable, then it must embed into the ultra product of L of Fn because uh, the ultra product of L of Fn contains the ultra power of, uh, of R. You want so anything that's con embeddable embeds into there so therefore now I found another embedding of L of Fn into there where it's actually an embedding of L of Fn tensor L infinity so this copy of L of Fn has a bunch of stuff that commutes with it right and uh, there's no way to even approximately conjugate these copies of L of Fn by automorphisms because uh, if you took the one that that was that didn't have anything that commutes with it, it actually doesn't have anything that approximately commutes with it either. Um, and so you couldn't approximate it by uh, automorphic conjugates of the other one. Okay, and so this is saying, okay, the non-commutative moments are not enough to determine the behavior of this random variable up to automorphism. Okay. Um, but there is something in model theory which does tell us how to distinguish them up to approximate automorphism or something of that nature. Right. And so this is the type in model theory. So I think uh, the previous two talks uh, avoided talking about formulas in model theory. Um, so I'm gonna uh, recap these a bit. Right. So when we're talking about the, the, the type, right, instead of just testing the non-commutative moments, we have to test uh, other quantities, right? Other, we have to do other measurements of your X in order to figure out what it does. And that is measurements that involve Soup and inf operations over unit poles. Um, so the formulas in model theory are built up uh, recursively through various operations. So you start with basic formulas. Um, and so for the, for the language of Trajal von Neumann algebras, these basic formulas are uh, formulas of the form, real part of trace of some non-commutative polynomial. Okay, those are, the, those are the things we've just talked about before with these uh, non-commutative moments. Um, then what else can you do? Well, you can take formulas that you already have, like several formulas, and then you can apply some continuous function f to them. And we're thinking of this here as analogous with applying uh, in, in dis discrete logic, you can apply uh, logical connectives like and and or, right? and we're replacing those things with continuous functions. Right? So we're taking our real valued uh, formulas, applying continuous function to them. Okay, and now here's the part where we have soups and ints, right? So in, where in classical logic, you use quantifiers like for all and there exists in the continuous logic, this real value logic, you use soup and ints. And in the soup and inf, you're supposed to take the soup and inf over uh, appropriate domains that are specified as part of your language. So for tracial von Neumann algebras, what you're allowed to do, uh, your domains are operator norm balls. And so you're allowed to take the soup or inf over some variable in your formula and uh, over an operator norm ball of whichever radius you want. Right, so if you have a formula in n plus one variables and then you take the soup or inf in one of the variables over the operator norm ball, you get a formula in n variables. Um, and then uh, by iterating these operations, you construct all these formulas. 
So uh, each formula is then something that you can evaluate on a tuple from your von Neumann algebra. Um, so you just plug in your specific x into the formula. Each soup and inf operation is interpreted as a soup or inf over the operator norm ball in your uh, spe specific m. Um, and of course, the evaluation of the formula very much depends on what the ambient algebra is, because if you take the soup over the operator norm ball, right, and if you did this over a larger algebra, then something else could happen than uh, compared to the smaller algebra. And then when you iterate the soups and ints and alternate between them, right, there's not even any monotonicity for a general formula under the inclusions of the algebra, right? So uh, if you choose a bigger algebra or a different, or just a different, different ambient algebra, or even if you have your copy of X sitting inside the M in a different way, then you can get different answers for these soups and ints. Um, so for instance, if you had some formula that involved commutators, right, then this formula could detect whether there uh, exist things that, uh, that approximately commute with your X's, right? And so in particular, formulas would distinguish the example that I had before, because there would be some formula saying that the, uh, you know, inf over the operator norm ball of the commutator of x and y is, is zero, meaning then there, that uh, you know, if you take the inf over y, you know, that would mean that there's, there's things that approximately commute with x. Okay. All right. So now when we, when we look at these formulas, then we can define the type of your tuple. And the type is just a, a mapping that records the values of all these formulas, right? So just like with a, a probability distribution, Probability distribution could be represented as a linear functional that takes in an input function as a test function and then spits out its expectation. And then in the same way, you can take the vector space of formulas and then have a, a mapping from the formulas to the real numbers, which just is the evaluation of the formula at the point map. And this is what we call the type of this tuple. Now in logic, there's also types over uh, relative to a specific set, and I'll get to that later. But here, this would be types uh, uh, relative to the empty uh, So just like the space of probability distributions, I want to consider the space of types. So the space of types, and uh, I'm not exactly sure the, who first used this notation, but they often use the letter S for the space of types. Um, and we want to have a topology on the space of types as well, um, just like for when we talk about probability distributions, we talk about we start topology on the space of probability distributions. We want the same for the type, right? So we, so, so uh, since this is uh, uh, linear functionals on a certain vector space, then there's a weak start topology. Right? So we use we use that weak start topology on the space of types for everything that comes from a certain operator norm ball. And maybe if you want to extend it to the whole space of types and not assume that you have a, a specific bound on on the operator norm of the x's then what you do is that uh, i think what works well is to consider inductive limit topology from the snr right so okay so if i have a tuple of operator no, of operators and their norm is less than or equal to r then they have a type and their type is in this space snr right and then if you consider the union over all r that's the entire space of types and I'm going to say a set is open in this space if and only if the intersection with each of the SNRs is open in there in the weak star topology. Okay. This definition may be a bit too absorb. Any questions about this? Okay, so before I get to go, get, return to the question of automorphisms that I started with, one more uh, detail about this um, is that, okay, so we have the space of formulas, right? And then we took a dual space of it um, by, by looking at these types, right? These types are, are elements of the dual space. Um, but then if you have a formula, then that again can be viewed as a continuous function on the space of types, right? Because a uh, uh, this is sort of like the embedding of X into X double dual, right? where X is the space of formulas. Uh, and the space of formulas is not is not complete, right? We, I mean, we we don't 
Right? We have to define a norm on it, right? but once you define a norm on it, it's not really complete. And we actually want to have something that's a bit, uh, that's uh, a nice completion of the space. Um, and so this is the notion of definable predicate. So basically a definable predicate is something that can be approximated by the formulas. And these definable predicates uh, represent an appropriate completion. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the continuous uh, functions on the space of types will correspond exactly to these definable predicates. Right? So uh, formulas will be special cases of this. But these definable predicates are somehow limits of formulas. And, and you can make it in the fall, make the following definition for them. All right, so uh, a definable predicate, you know, you could just, there, you, there's a couple of approaches to defining it. I mean, rather than defining it as like a, a, like just abstractly taking a completion of the space of formulas, I'm just going to define it at, as a collection of functions. So for each von Neumann algebra M, you want to be able to evaluate your definable predicate. So you have a collection of uh, functions uh, from M to the N to R, for each m, um, but then the approximation by formulas is that uh, for every epsilon and for every r, there exists a formula which approximates uh, there exists a formula p which approximates phi uniformly on uh, the product of operator norm ball of radius r in m, right? and this approximation is uniform over all m. Right? So if you have some some object like this, that is like a uniform limit of these formulas, and that's the definable predicate. Right. And so we really want to you know, think about this topologically as well. The space of types is some nice compact Hausdorff space, and this space of uh, and the space of definable predicates is this, the space of continuous functions on the space. Okay, so now um, coming back to this question of automorphism, the types do detect uh, the behavior of, of X up to automorphism. I, and here, what I'm going to say is, uh, yeah, so there are some issues to deal with, uh, well, do you want an actual automorphism on the entire thing or just an, an automorphism on uh, you know, some larger space? Uh, but what you can do that's pretty nice is that you can uh, take your M, and the M has an elementary extension in which the types precisely correspond to automorphism with it. Right. So you can find an elementary extension in which the uh, uh, two things have the same type, if and only if they're conjugate by an automorphism. Um, so I guess I didn't define, I didn't say out loud the definition of elementary extension, but elementary extension means that if you take any formula and you evaluate it uh, on things that come from M, uh, then if you use N as the ambient algebra, you get the same answer as if you use M as the ambient algebra. So in particular, right, if you're doing the soup and info operations, taking uh, the soup over M and taking the soup over N give you the same answer um, if you're plugging in constants that come from M. Yep. So these types do actually capture the behavior of variables up to automorphism. Um, and for that reason, we might want to view these as an analog of uh, the probability distribution. Right. So coming back to the classical case, right? Earlier we saw in the classical case that actually if you have the same probability distribution, right, and you don't need to use any formulas with soups and ifs, you just need to know the expectation of each polynomial. Then in classical probability, if they have if they have the same distribution, then they will be approximately conjugate by automorphisms, and so therefore they will have the same type. Uh, and so in model theoretic terminology, what this means, uh, you know, testing the moments with any polynomial. Um, this is these are uh, no these uh, generate these quantifier free formulas, right? So these are these basic formulas. If you take the basic formulas and apply continuous functions, these are the quantifier free. And so having the same non-commutative moments is just saying the quantifier free type is the same. And saying that it, in classical probability, if they have the same quantifier free type, they're approximately conjugate by automorphism. That will mean that if they have the same quantifier free type, they have the same complete type. And so in order to know how the X and Y behave with respect to all these formulas involving soup and inf, you actually don't have to test any of the formulas with soup and inf. All you have to do is test the quantifier free formulas and that uniquely determines their behavior on all of them. Right? And this is expressing the fact that this 
this classical probability space, classical diffuse probability space, admits quantifier elimination. So it actually uh, tells you that uh, any definable predicate in this, uh, if you evaluate it on this L infinity space, is going to have to agree with a quantifier free definable predicate, which is like a, a limit of the quantifier free formulas. Yeah. And so basically, the reason why non commutative probability is more complicated is because in classical probability, there is quantifier elimination. So basically, lots of stuff that you would do with soups and ifs becomes trivial, and you can kind of just uh, reduce it to something much. Uh, simpler. In the non commutative case, we don't have that luxury, and that makes stuff a lot more interesting. And so, in particular, if we're trying to develop non commutative probability theory, it has, uh, we have to take account of, of, uh, of these facts. Um, and so, it might, might actually be better, instead of just looking at non commutative moments of something, to look at the complete type as an analog of the non commutative, as a, I say, a non commutative analog of the probability distribution. So in particular, um, we would want to take concepts from classical probability, like the Wasserstein distance right, and the uh, optimal couplings. I'll tell you about these in a, in a moment, um, as well as free entropy. So in Sui's talk, he alluded to this the notion of free entropy, of uh, measuring the volume of uh, the space of matrix approximations for your X. Um, and so you can actually develop an analog of that where instead of just considering approximations with non commutative moments, you actually use all these formulas, right? not just the quantifier free one. Right, so, this is the goal of my talk. Um, there's actually several papers this is based on, which are kind of developing many of these ideas uh, from uh, classical and then non commutative probability into this setting of, of complete time. Okay. So, several things that will come up. Uh, one thing that comes up several times in what I'm about to present are, the, are these notions of algebraic and definable closure. So this might seem like a detour from what I said before, but you'll see later how this comes in. So earlier I was talking about uh, automorphism orbits, right? When are two tuples equivalent by an automorphism, et cetera, right? And now you can also do this relative to some subset A. So um, if you have some subset A, um, you can kind of do all the concepts that I said relative to this A. So you can take formulas instead of just regular formulas where you take non commutative polynomials in X, you also allow the non commutative polynomials to contain constants from the set A. And so you kind of view this as like, I guess, non commutative polynomials with coefficients from A. And so you take those polynomials, you use them to build basic formulas, right? And you construct the formulas recursively with the sup and inf operations, right? But now all these formulas are formulas that can contain constants from A. Um, and so then, analogously, you define the type over A as the mapping from this set of uh, formulas with coefficients from A into the real number. Um, and so now, uh, if you consider, um, yeah, if you consider this uh, question of conjugacy by automorphisms, right, if you have some subset of N, and let's assume that this N has this nice, uh, strongly homogeneous property that the uh, types correspond to automorphism orbits, well, now you could ask yourself, well, suppose I consider automorphisms that fix the set A point-wise, then what else has to be fixed by those automorphisms, right? And if you, if you consider this analogous thing for field, this is exactly like the Galois closure of the subfield generated by A. Right, so, uh, and then there's a similar notion of algebraic closure. Um, and the algebraic closure uh, is a set of things where you know, every automorphism that fixes A doesn't necessarily fix X, but it can't move X around too much, right? So automorphisms that fix A will, uh, if you apply them to X, it will generate an orbit which is compact. Um, so if you replace compact with finite and you thought about the field case, right, then this is actually like legitimately talking about being algebraic. But since we're in the metric setting, we don't just care if the set is finite, what we really care about is whether it's finite up to epsilon for every epsilon, which means that it's compact um, or totally bounded. Yeah. So these are the definable and algebraic closure. And then if you think about this in terms of types, right, the, the type, uh, the real the set of realizations of the type over A corresponds to this automorphism orbit under the things that fix A. 
And so then saying that it's in the algebraic closure means that the that X is the unique realization of its type over A. And then being in the algebraic, the algebraic closure means that the realization set of realizations of the type of X over A is compact. Okay. Now I think there's not been that much study of definable and algebraic closures for von Neumann algebras, so I wanted to give a couple propositions to illustrate what these things behave like. So first of all, uh, let's say I'm going to take a, I'm going to consider A to be a subalgebra, right, not just a subset, because it turns out the definable and algebraic closures are automatically von Neumann algebras, so I really only care about the case if uh, A is von Neumann algebra already. So let's take a subalgebra of M. Um, and then the definable closure is contained in the relative bicommutant. And this is an immediate observation. The reason is uh, that you can get automorphisms of the von Neumann algebra that come from conjugation by a unitary. Right? And if you take a unitary in the commutant of A uh, inside of, of M, then that uh, automorphism induced by that unitary will fix a pointwise. Uh, and so therefore, if you're in the definable closure, then every unitary in the relative commutant uh, is, the, is forced to fix this X under conjugation. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, any von Neumann algebra is generated by, by unitaries, um, in fact, spanned by unitaries. Um, and so, if I show it, so, so if I take an X, if X commutes with every, uh, with all the unitaries in uh, the relative commutant, then therefore X actually has to commute with everything in the relative commutant. Um, and so therefore it's in the relative bicommutant. Yes. Yeah, so it, that's that's a good uh, example. Let me write this with chalk, right? So, so let's say that you have M and you embed it into its ultra product, right? So then the definable closure inside the ultra product of M will just be uh, M itself. And uh, the reason for this is the general fact that uh, the definable closure of something has to be contained inside of in, in any elementary submodel that contains it. Actually, here's a fact, which I, I guess I didn't, I didn't put in my slides. But fact, if you have this M, which is like a, like saturated and uh, strongly homogeneous uh, in as above, then the uh, algebraic closure in M uh, of some A is actually to the, the intersection of all uh, intersection of all uh, n, which is elementary submodel of M, uh, which contains A. So this is another way to think about the algebraic closure. Any elementary submodel is forced to contain the algebraic closure. Yeah. So one of the one remark that I would like to make is that there's a famous uh, open question of Sodium Boba uh, that is the relative uh, bicommutant. Uh, the diagonal embedding inside the ultra power is equal to the diagonal embedding. Uh, then is it true that it's isomorphic to the type of diagonal embedding? Well, the relative, okay, the relative by common. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question, but that is a nice connection. Okay. In your observation, did you mean DCL of? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So sorry. I I knew there would be some typo somewhere, uh, but I didn't. I looked through it and I couldn't find the typo. <laughs> so yeah, the algebraic closure in M of A. Yeah. Yep. So it always. So as another example, right? If you have a maximal abelian subalgebra, then the relative commutant of it is itself, and so the relative bicommutant of it is also itself. And the definable closure will then be equal to itself. Now here's a well. I want I want there to be an actual automorphism of the entire M, right? And I'm not necessarily assuming the continuum hypothesis. So I'm not. 
Countably saturated, yeah. yeah. I mean, both, they're both countable, yeah. If you, if you made it much more saturated, then I suppose this will be true. Okay, anyway, so here's another example where, here's an example where the definable closure can be much larger than the original M. Uh, and so this actually has to do with rigidity. Um, so suppose that I have A inside M, and I, I'm assuming that uh, it's an irreducible subfactor, meaning that the relative commutant of A inside M is trivial. These are just the complex numbers. Right? And I'm assuming that it has spectral gap, which means like that there's nothing that approximately commutes with A in, in M. Um, and so then the, uh, the conclusion is that if you take the normalizer in M of A, right? So the normalizer is a set of unitaries such that U A U star equals A. That normalizer uh, is contained inside the algebraic closure. And actually the commutator subgroup of the normalizer is contained inside the definable closure. Right? And here's why. Um, okay, so here I'm gonna reason just from being fixed under automorphisms. I mean, there's another reason I could uh, uh, reason and prove this more formally in terms of the, like the, the formulas and the types, but let me just do it with a kind of this Galois perspective. So assume that I make an elementary extension where uh, you know, it's, it's homogeneous. And suppose that I have U, which is in the normalizer. And suppose then I have an automorphism fixing A. So if I have an automorphism fixing A, then uh, I wanna consider, oops, I consider, uh, I want to consider what is alpha of u. So uh, now we look at alpha of u, and alpha of u, if we conjugate an element in A, uh, well, A is fixed by alpha, so I could rewrite this as alpha of A, or I could write it as al alpha of u star A u. That's assumed to be an A, so that's also fixed by alpha, right? So if I have something in A, then the conjugation of it by alpha of u is the same as the conjugation of it by u. And so that actually, if you rearrange this, this means that uh, alpha u star u or uh, alpha u inverse u commutes with everything in A. And um, by our assumption about the spectral gap and having trivial relative commutant, that will mean that it's a scalar multiple of the identity. Um, and so say it's uh, lambda of u times u. And so then, in particular, the, the set of realizations of the type of U or the automorphism orbit of U is contained inside scalar multiples of U. And so, in particular, it's compact. So that, that means it's in the algebraic closure. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's a good point. But uh, if it has spectral gap, then this will be true because if it will be true for any elementary extension that it will have a trivial relative commutant as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could say so that whatever the n is, right, the n will be contained in some ultra power of n, right? And the commutant in there will still be trivial. Because I assume this has spectral gap. Yeah. Right. And now the second part of the proof: Why uh, is the commutator subgroup in the in the definable closure? Well, if I have this automorphism, right, and if each u is mapped to a scalar multiple of itself, uh, it's an automorphism, so it respects multiplication, and so that will imply that this lambda sub u is a character, right? Lambda sub u v is lambda u times lambda v. And so it's a, it's a homomorphism from your group into a commutative group. And so it, thus it vanishes on the commutator subgroup. So if, if it's in the commutator subgroup, then actually it's a unique realization of its type over A. And so it's in the definable closure. Uh, so there are many, so I, I should say there's many examples to which this uh, proposition applies uh, because for instance, um, Suppose that A has property P, and then uh, and then you take a, an, uh, a properly outer action of some group on the property P thing to generate your M, and then uh, then in this case the definable or say the uh, algebraic closure will be the entire M. Um, and 
uh, recently in the work of Ioana, Jumba, uh, Osun, and Sun, they, no, wait, Ifan, maybe. Okay, whatever. They had this paper on, a uh, very important paper on property P, um, and in particular, they showed that you can have basically any group that you want uh, act by uh, uh, have an, an outer action of any group that you want upon something with property T. And so then uh, that will construct a lot of examples like this. So, you, so the group the group acting on your thing will generate elements of the normalizer. Um, and then if the thing is property T, um, then and uh, your, your action is properly outer, then you'll, it will be irreducible and it will have this. Um, so I'm gonna, this is the last thing I'll say about uh, like uh, this construction per se, but I think this is an, a good result to motivate like trying to study connections between rigidity and von Neumann algebras versus these uh, notions from models. Okay, so now, um, now I'm going to talk about kind of the analogs of optimal transport theory for these types, right? So remember I was saying the types, the complete type is a good analog for probability distribution, and then I want to take ideas from classical probability and uh, implement them for uh, the type. Um, so in particular, there's this notion of Wasserstein distance, and already in past work, uh, such as by Song, people have studied probability spaces from um, a, a model theoretic perspective, and Song in particular studied the L1 Wasserstein distance in this framework. Uh, now, I'm going to study the L2 Wasserstein distance here, but in the non-commutative setting. And, uh, and this Wasserstein distance actually co coincides with a more general model theoretic concept, which is the so-called D metric on the space of types. What is this D metric? Well, you just consider your two types, I'll call them mu and nu. Uh, right, so I have two types. The distance between them is this, the infimum of the distance of X and Y, where X and Y are any realizations of these types. Now, if you think about a situation where the types correspond to automorphism orbits um, and it's saturated enough, then uh, this distance between types, you could think of it as how close are these two automorphism orbits, right? You look at your orbits and like, what's the minimum distance between these two orbits, right? So that's, that's the Wasserstein distance between, uh, between these things. Now, um, in classical probability theory, the Wasserstein distance gives you something that gives you the same as the weak star topology on the space of uh, probability distributions. And, I'm, and this is actually not gonna be true in the non-commutative setting, um, so one uh, way that you can see this is a, a continuous version of real Nazirsky theorem. And it's saying the Wasserstein distance gives you the weak star topology if and only if the theory that you're studying is uh, kind of Aleph not categorical. Um, I'm not gonna define what that means, but this is something which is true for the commutative probability spaces. And it's very much related to this fact that any two things with the same uh, quantifier free type are approximately conjugate by automorphism, right? So this is very closely related to that and to the, the quantifier elimination of the classical probability space. Um, but most of the time, if you read the papers of uh, uh, Goldbring, Hart, and Sinclair, and the papers of Farr, Hart, and Sherman, like they show there's not, this, it's, it's very, it's impossible for any 2-1 factor to have this property. And so in particular for, for that theory, you, you can't have the Wasserstein distance agree everywhere with the uh, weak star topology. Um, but you could also ask a more refined question. So what if the two topologies agree at some point, meaning uh, that every the neighborhood of the point in one topology contains a neighborhood in the other topology. Um, and if that's true, that uh, that corresponds to, then that, then that point is called a principal type. Um, and it's an open question at this point to figure out what the principal types are. So it's, it's true, if your X generates an amenable algebra, then, the, then its type will be a principal type. But other than that, we don't really know much, um, at least not that I'm aware. Um, so in the quantifier free setting, earlier in the, the paper with uh, Yangbo, Nam, and Shliak-Tenko, and it looks like I forgot a comma between Nam and Shliak-Tenko there, so there's another typo. Um, but anyway, we, we studied the Wasserstein distance on the space of quantifier free types. And in that case, we showed 
if, if you're looking in the con embeddable setting, then being a principal quantifier free type is actually equivalent to generating something amenable. Um, this doesn't, this, the same proof doesn't, that doesn't automatically uh, work for the setting of complete types. Um, so there's a lot more to do here to figure out what's going on. Um, but this is a, a good open question to think about. Can you figure, can you uh, classify or if not classify, I mean, at least figure out some, uh, some uh, better understanding of what could be principal types for uh, the theory of some to one factor. Okay. So, uh, yeah. All right. So looking at these two topologies, we see some things where the classical theory and the non-commutative theory are pretty different. Um, but what I'm going to say next is uh, something where you can succeed in emulating the classical theory to some extent. And uh, that's in uh, uh, looking at a kind of dual characterization of this Bosser Stein distance. So uh, I'm going to express the Bosser Stein distance in an, in, an, in an equivalent way by kind of testing the values of certain definable predicates on each of the two types. Now, in order to do this, there's a couple of a little bit of notation. Um, the first, since we're trying to minimize the L2 distance between uh, X and Y, and X and Y are assumed to have a particular type mu and nu, um, well, the L2 norm of X and the L2 norm of Y are then fixed because they're just determined by what the type is. And so then the, in order to make the L2 distance as small as possible, the only thing that I need to do is make the inner product as large as possible. Because if I expand out the L2 norm squared, right, I expand that out, then I have a norm of X squared plus norm of Y squared minus twice the real part of the inner product. And I guess I wrote inner product there, but I, you should really say the real part of the inner product. Okay. And I think that applies throughout the talk. When I write inner product here, you should just assume the real part of the inner product. Okay, so then this C of, of mu nu, I'm just going to define this to be the soup of the uh, real part of inner product of, uh, of X and Y. And uh, saturation will imply that this supremum is achieved. Um, okay, and so now we want to characterize what is, what is the supremum. Um, so in the classical case, you have the following theorem. So say that you have probability distributions, which uh, correspond to types in the classical probability space. Um, so then you can uh, characterize this C of mu nu, this like maximal uh, inner product between copies of X and Y. You can characterize it as the infimum of integral of F d mu plus integral of G d nu over pairs of convex functions F and G that uh, satisfy this certain inequality, right? And I mean, this is kind of magical, right? Because this, is not like this f and g, these are just functions of one variable, right? And I'm just testing, uh, you know, integrating f with respect to mu and integrating g with respect to nu. And then if I test all the convex functions that satisfy such an inequality like this, then uh, this will capture, sorry, this will capture this uh, uh, optimal uh, inner product. So with uh, Gangbo and Naman Shliakchenko, we studied this for uh, quantifier free types for the tracial von Neumann algebras. Um, and we, get, we had some theorem of that. But what I did recently in the paper, which I posted last week, is the version for complete types. So in the version for complete types, what do you do? Um, you kind of have the same type of, of statement. Um, you have the infimum of a phi of mu and phi of nu. So this just means, that, okay, the pairing between the definable predicate and the type because uh, definable predicates are uh, continuous functions on the space of types, uh, right? So that's the analog, or at least an analog of this, right? So you, you take the infimum of this and you consider definable predicates that are convex, right? So the definable predicate is a, is a function that you evaluate on tuples and you just demand that that's a convex function. And if it's, if it's convex and if it satisfies this, uh, inequality, although right here, maybe there's a little bit of defect here and that I'm only assuming this inequality on a, a, a product of operator norm ball. Um, and 
but this is basically like an analog of the previous theorem. I guess another defect or difference at least is, is that uh, when I'm talking about definable predicates, if I were looking at that in the classical probability case, the definable predicates are, don't always come from the pointwise functions f and g on Rn. Um, so in a sense, this theorem doesn't exactly mimic, mimic this case because it's very difficult to understand what, what, what would be the analog of points in the non-commutative setting. Um, but it is, it is a pretty uh, similar result. Um, and I'll remark, I guess I'll make, keep this short for the sake of time, but basically this theorem works out better for the complete types than it does just for the quantifier free type. I mean, and I think, you know, this is one of the motivations for trying to study the version for complete type is that some things work out better and, and this is one of them. Okay, so hmm, I may or may not have time to even get to entropy at all. But I do want to tell you about the convex definable predicates. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, question about the definable closure. Uh, do you prove something like uh, if you have a uh, subalgebra uh, n of m, uh, then the one bounded entropy of n in the presence of m is equal to the one bounded entropy of the definable closure? That's a question that's relevant at a different point in this talk, like later on. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. But you prove it or not? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. Ask me the question later. This is this is not the right point to ask this question. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. So how do we study these convex definable predicates? So you might remember uh, a function is convex. Say a function on the Hilbert space is convex. If in uh, say okay, say a lower semi-continuous convex function. Right? It's, uh, this happens uh, if and only if for each point there's a some vector, right? Or there's some there's some say hyperplane that uh, is underneath the graph of your function. Uh, and so we want to prove a kind of a similar result for the convex definable predicate. And what happens actually in, in this case is that you can find, not only can you find a, a, a vector, which is a subgradient, which gives you this uh, supporting hyperplane, but actually you can find this vector in the definable closure of uh, X, the point where you're, where you're trying to uh, uh, kind of look at the, the point where you're considering differentiating your function. Right? And so what is the reason for this? Well, um, okay, so first of all, we pass to an elementary extension that's sufficiently uh, nice. And if you look at all the vectors y that satisfy such an inequality, right, the, the y's that satisfy this inequality uh, are going to form a closed convex set. And then if you have a closed convex set in the Hilbert space, then it's a unique point of a minimum, of minimal norm. Now, if you consider automorphisms, of your thing that fix x, then uh, and uh, well, if it's an automorphism, then this this uh, function phi is also invariant under automorphism. So if the automorphism fixes x, then this convex set of, of uh, vectors y, this convex set of subgradient vectors, will be invariant under the automorphism. And so, in particular, the point of minimal L2 norm has to be uh, fixed by the automorphism as well, which means it will be in the definable closure. Um, another consequence of this is that these convex definable predicates satisfy a sort of Jensen's inequality type statement, which is the following: that if you have a, if you have a, a n, which is an elementary extension of m, or equivalently m is an elementary submodel of n, then uh, f of the conditional expectation of something onto m is less than or equal to f. And the reason for this is the following, that uh, say I let, say I pick a point Z, I wanna compare the values of phi on Z and on the conditional expectation of Z. And well, I pick a, a, a subgradient vector Y as in the previous slide, that's in L2 of the definable closure of, of X. Um, and then 
and I use I use that uh, you know subgradient condition at the point x, and because the definable closure has to be contained inside any elementary submodel that contains x, then this y is actually actually comes from m, and so if I take the inner product of a y and z minus x, this will be zero because y comes from m, and because uh, z minus x is z minus the conditional expectation of it onto m. Right? And so, and so you get this kind of Jensen's inequality. Right? And so, if you think about Jensen's inequality, Jensen's inequality in general is like a, a a statement about about averaging. And in this case, if you have this conditional expectation, I don't know for sure this conditional expectation can be given by averaging, right? But somehow the role of like choosing the minimal thing in in L two norm kind of takes uh, replaces the the uh, philosophy of averaging in this. Um, but you kind of get remnants of what you would think from classical convex functions in, in here. All right, so here's another type of uh, statement that comes out from this reasoning of kind of using classical convex functions uh, to uh, uh, using ideas from classical convex analysis and applying them to these definable predicates. So if you have an optimal coupling, of two types, meaning like X and Y are have the types mu and nu respectively, and they realize the closest uh, distance. Then if you take a strict convex combination of X and Y, uh, then that thing, the definable closure of that thing has to generate everything that came from X and Y. So the definable closure of uh, X and Y has to be the same as the definable closure of the strict convex combination. And in a sense, this is a kind of an analog of uh, optimal transport theory, because in optimal transport theory, classically, this is, this is true. If you have an optimal coupling, then uh, for anything that's strictly in the middle, you can, exp you can express all, each of them as a functions of the other ones. Um, and this idea of uh, being in the definable closure is, in a sense, something like expressing that it's a function, that one thing is a function of the other one. Now, I'm, a I'm actually going to make another claim here that actually X and Y are not only in the definable closure, they can be expressed by applying definable functions to X and Y, to, to this thing. Um, this is actually a general statement that's true for Fraschel von Neumann algebras, and I believe the same argument would work for, for continuous model theory in general if your structures come, uh, sort of uh, come have a, if your metric spaces are basically subsets of some Hilbert space. If your if your language is some some sort of Hilbert space with additional structure, which I think in in Fraschel von Neumann algebra it is, because you have the inner product coming from this space. All right. So this this the statement is that uh, anything which is in the definable closure can be expressed as a definable function of the of the uh, set that you're taking the definable closure of. Uh, now I haven't told you. So up at the top, I guess I have the definition of definable function. The definable function means that I have a that it, it's a function that I can evaluate on arbitrary tuples, and then the uh, distance between f of y or sorry f of x and y will be a definable predicate. And so this theorem is essentially saying the following: like suppose suppose that I have something in the definable closure, right? That's just okay for my particular a. I, there's an X which is in the definable closure. Um, but then I'm saying that you can actually make a continuous selection. If you, if you replaced, instead of having particular A1, A2, et cetera, uh, that were constants, you could, uh, you, if you allowed those things to vary, you can actually find a, a continuous selection of uh, something uh, in the definable closure of, uh, of say, Ys. Um, which at that particular choice of A will give you our, the particular element Z, which is in the definable closure of, of that. Um, okay. And the, the way that this works, well, first of all, kind of by general facts about model theory there and like reasoning with these definable predicates and stuff. Um, well, if the distance is a definable predicate and so will, then the inner product should also be a definable predicate um, and if it's definable predicate over A, then that will mean that you can actually express this as a definable, some definable predicate that you can evaluate on arbitrary points. And, but 
now you take this definable predicate and evaluate it on x and a1, a2, et cetera. Right? And so this is true, you know, for this particular a1, a2, this, uh, this definable predicate agrees with the inner product of x and z. And now if I had this phi and I and if I differentiate it with respect to x, then I'll get back the vector z. And the gradient with respect to x of the, this thing will be z. Uh, so what I really want to do is to say that I can arrange my phi to not just be any definable predicate, but one which is globally differentiable with respect to x. And so then I'll use the gradient with respect to x as this definable function to achieve this result. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, I have not much time left. Okay, but so so I may go quickly here. I'll try to say the, the basic ideas out loud. If you don't have time to read everything on the slides, that's fine. You can read them later. Okay, but the idea here is I take an arbitrary definable predicate and then I want to somehow regularize it and make it smooth. So I want to arrange that it's differentiable and that the gradient is also a definable function. How can I do that? Um, well, if you have functions on an infinite dimensional space, you can't necessarily use the same tools in finite dimensions. Like in finite dimensions, you take a function and you convolve it with a smooth, compactly supported function, and then this will uh, make it smoother. And this is how you get you know, arbitrary continuous functions to be approximated by smooth functions. In infinite dimensional space, you cannot exactly do that, but you can do something else. Um, which is in fact a, a sort of regularization where you use soups and ints to kind of uh, force your function to be semi-convex and semi-concave, meaning it's sort of you, you force your function to uh, kind of be smooth enough so that you can touch it from above and below by parabolas. And uh, this, and and once you do that, then it will then it will be forced to be a C1 function with a lift its gradient. Uh, uh. So using such a method like this, you can actually show the following theorem that you can approximate any definable predicate by one which is, uh, uh, you know, by one which is like a definably C1 function, right? It has a gradient, which is a definable predicate and which is Lipschitz, right? And the way that you do this is some kind of formulas with soups and ints. So I have a formula of original formula phi in variables x and y, and then I want to find another formula, which is going to be a, a, a kind of C1 as a function of X. You can do it in the following way by taking like some soup and some int. Okay, now don't worry specifically about this formula. It's just some quadratic thing. It will force it to be semi-convex and semi-concave. And then from there, you, you kind of reason with, uh, with convexity and, uh, you know, and you, you keep uh, arguing until you show that it's differentiable and that the gradient is a definable predicate. And the definability of it really comes from the fact that uh, this function has a Lipschitz gradient. And so, it, and so if you look at the uh, limit to define directional derivatives, then this limit will occur uniformly. And this uniformity is what allows you to kind of get, get the thing to be definable. So the takeaway from this, okay, maybe, too fast to get the details of this last part, but the point is that that say convex analysis and optimal transport theory may naturally go together and combine with this continuous model theory, because if you're doing these operations on convex functions, like doing these uh, inf convolution and soup convolutions, or if you're doing Legendre transform of a convex function, that's a soup, and so it's very natural to say that if you took uh, formulas in continuous model theory and then do these operations to them, this will create other formulas. Right? Because you, you know, you're you just using soup and int operations. Right? And the other claim is that using these types is a good framework to make optimal transport theory work. Uh, and another takeaway from the previous result that I stated here is actually shows that there's a lot of definable functions. I mean, it's something which wasn't really clear before, like you know, you can might write the definition and prove properties of definable functions, but how do you know these things actually exist? Well, earlier I showed there's an example, right, with where with the spectral gap, where you get a lot of things in the definable closure that weren't in the original algebra. And then more recently I said, 
well, everything in the definable closure can be realized as a definable function applied to some elements from the algebra. So in particular, there have to be enough definable functions that you can actually express all these things as a definable function. Right? And before this, I wasn't aware of any examples where, you know, of a definable function where, where you even know that the output of the function isn't in the von Neumann algebra uh, you know, of, of the input point. Um, but this shows there actually have to be a pretty large amount of uh, definable functions. All right, so I'm out of time. I have more to say about the entropy um, and adapting that to the model theoretic setting. Um, but uh, you can ask me afterward if you want to learn more about.